we've got a visitor today. Uh, Greg, if you want to go ahead and make your presentation, then we'll let you leave after that. If you, we won't require you to stay the whole time. So you can go ahead and. My name is Greg Shoulders. I'm with Government Services, the LLC. Um, the program uh, focuses on property abandonment and property tax collection. It probably is a little more famous for those who have had an opportunity to interact with it for the collection of the property taxes. And so the brochure that you have in front of you today, if you look on the back slide, you'll actually see four things that the program actually achieves above and beyond just collecting the property taxes. We literally have collected 100% property taxes and cleaned up the tax rolls within some cities that have followed the program as it's designed. We have eliminated 100% abandonment in the cities that have followed this program. We are also now in the process of teaching the cities how to be a vested partner and build a self-funding mechanism that will allow you to have the money to maintain and oversee non-exempt properties. And we help people. One of the things that I have to say is that for me to even be here today suggests to me that the leaders in this community recognize and are open to the fact that to keep doing things the same way and expecting a different result is not the right answer. But to stop doing things means that you have to have a paradigm shift. And a paradigm shift is only going to succeed if the foundation of that paradigm is based on truth. I want to share, you why, share with you why I'm involved in this program and founded Government Services LLC. It did exist in 2012. I grew up in the city of Providence, Kentucky, over in Webster County. Now, it's been 40 years since I've had a Providence mailing address. In fact, it's been 30 years since I've had an address in the state of Kentucky. I currently live in Indianapolis. But in 2012, the city of Providence called me and asked, could you help us collect our delinquent taxes? It's really going to help the people of the city. And so I made a point of traveling down to Providence. We collected 100% of their property taxes, literally in their case, hundreds of thousands of dollars. We did that in a period of two years. What made us go beyond property tax collection is that kind of broke my heart to see that it really didn't change the lives of the people in that community. And when I do go to Providence, I travel through various parts of the city, and I see the vacant lots missed with the missing houses. It used to be homes of the families I knew. And I see the buildings that are in disrepair, and I see the unsafe conditions, and they need to be raised. And I think of my parents, who were buried in a city-owned cemetery. And when I recognize that Providence used to be a town of 6,000 people, and today only 3,000 people carry the burden of the infrastructure for 6,000, I worry about when I'm gone and my siblings are gone, how in the world are my parents going to rest in peace and in dignity if that city is not self-sufficient? So we went about studying how do we make a paradigm shift so we can help make Providence and all other cities self-sufficient. Let me, let me tell you, when I got that call, I was real excited to come help my hometown. Beyond that, I saw it as an opportunity to eliminate the current abusive state statutes relating to property tax lien sales in Kentucky. It is very abusive. It needs to change. And we're fortunate we have a county and a city collection system. There's a parallel system. We can run live tests between how, is, how well is the county collecting taxes and abusing people versus how the cities go about it. And the counties have the support of the state. The cities are doing it all on their own. And so we have proven that in every, we're doing counties from Muhlenberg County as far east as Pulaski County and just last week Jackson County, a little further east, also verbally agreed to sign up to the program. And in a matter of four months, almost in every case, we've out-collected counties versus their past 11 years. 
and we've also done it in that getting to that goal without tax sales and without foreclosures. Now, I'll say you don't need a tax sale to collect 10% of taxes. You don't need a tax sale to eliminate abandonment. You may need foreclosures. It is a biblical responsibility of government to provide orderly restraint. And basically, abandonment is the abandonment of ownership responsibility, which is quite simply stated as pay your taxes and mow your yard. The neighbor who's sitting next door, who's doing everything right, who's made an investment in that property to store up their treasures, is only losing value when the neighbor next door doesn't fulfill their responsibility. And that neighbor can't do anything about it. Only local government. I mean, not even federal government is going to do it. It takes local government to do that. As we go further and we look at you know, how do you, how do you build this fund? And if we had been doing it the way I'm going to tell you, for the past hundred years, you'd be sitting on a pot of gold right now. Basically, we found is that for every 1,000 non-exempt parcels that a community has, the current rate of abandonment is one parcel. I'm assuming you have somewhere between 1,000 to maybe 2,000 parcels here in Hartford. Um, the status report that I've given you that we pass out to the communities show you shows Greenville, for example, has 2,000 parcels. It houses 4,000 people. It has a current abandonment of two. So in the case of Greenville, you take two times $2,200. That's the cost for every parcel to maintain that. Where do I get that number? I know you can foreclose master all the way to the master commissioner sale for $2,200. So two times $2,200 is $4,400 to maintain and oversee ownership responsibility in your community. Greenville has a budget of over a million dollars. $4,400 doesn't kill them. They now set aside $10,000 a year to do the foreclosures. And then we're also working with local bankers and hoping to work with the Kentucky Bankers Association to do a statewide program where that we take the money that's set aside in this account after the foreclosures to help maintain the structures in the city or maybe even build some. And we exponentially increase the money available to investment by working with the banks. One example may very well be when people, if the bank would offer, if you want to build a hundred thousand dollar home, the bank offers a certain amount of money and then there's a second mortgage that they provide but the city guarantee, helps the guarantee of it, you literally can take three, four, or five thousand dollars, set it into an escrow account, earn interest, and that loan's paid off. <coughs> that money's returned back to this land bank account of the cities. And each year you just keep piling on. You're taking nickels and dimes, and it's going to turn into dollars and cents. The thing about home ownership, you got to remember it's an investment. And it's an investment that comes complete with risk and reward and responsibility. Responsibility requires accountability, and the accountability is the responsibility of local government. When we go down this road, we're talking about all the ways to deal with property tax collection, all the ways to deal with property abandonment and the issues, I could stand up here for hours and talk to you. That's why I want this to be a discussion. What's important to you today? What's on your mind? And well, let's talk about the paradigm shift and how that fits. On the inside of that brochure, you'll see that this program that I'll share with you is based on three foundational sources. One, national studies dating back to 1932. And understand I said the word study. I didn't say the policies and the practices of people in power for the last 100 years. I said the studies, the good sound advice that these people paid for but then never implemented the advice. The other source is my own personal experience collecting property taxes across two states, Indiana and Kentucky. And the third is based on biblical principles and there's not a detail in this program that doesn't agree with all three sources or it wouldn't be there. That is the reason that we can achieve 100%. Now the cost to the city, 
for my services is nothing. The program is designed, and you already have it built to your ordinance, even though <coughs> I have provided you another ordinance that we're trying to standardize across the state, that basically covers the cost of collection. You would apply, in this case, a $75 fee to each bill, and only when that's been collected, the city has been fully paid for your penalties, your interest, and other costs that you may have. That $75 is all part of the taxes, the cost of collection that the delinquent taxpayer pays, and then you forward me that fee. So it will cost you nothing as far as a budget line item, and it's something I'm willing to do because I know what's going to happen. Okay. Any questions or, or comments or anything yeah. I've run the bar here? <laughs> how did you guys achieve a hundred percent? I mean, how are you sweeping blood out of the turnip? I guess. Here's the thing. As you look at this bell-shaped curve on this diagram, you see that uh, uh, even, even the national studies going back to 1971 and 1932 says that we need to align our municipal policies with the tax collection process. In the, at the beginning where it says reward, well, the state of Kentucky, unlike Indiana, already does that. You send out your tax bill, and you say, come pay us within 30 days, and we're going to give you a 2% discount. Government, and that's a biblical thing, too, is that when you do good, government you know, should commend you for that. Well, there's your 2%. That expect period is your November to December, most of the seats are at least the county level. We expect you to come pay your bill in full. Okay? The, the third area of aligning municipal policies, it says aid. Now, here, we believe that the first year somebody goes delinquent, that something changed in their life. Now, it could be a loss of job, it could be death, it could be illness, whatever it is, but something changed. They didn't enter an investment with the intention of not being responsible for it in the beginning. So what is it? Let's fix it while it's small. Okay? But at the same time, short-term collection requires some penalties, some interest, some noticing, and some deadlines. That's the first year. Then the policy becomes, you become a liability. After the second year of delinquency, foreclosure is the final hammer. It needs to take place. And, and you can see from the status reports, for example, in Vine Grove, Vine Grove over in Hardin County, next to, right there with Elizabeth Town and all of that, they collected 83% and they began the program in, in January of this year. Their mayor was leaving at the end of the year and said, I want to clean up abandonment. And so they made the investments, start doing the foreclosures and to do the program and they're having outstanding results as a result of it. So they're, like the program says in the national study in 1932, the cause of good government would be served and benefit would accrue to all if a procedure could be adopted that is a single course that is short and clear and certain. Now, I paraphrase that a little bit because in the midst of all of that, it comes right out in that 1932 study and says there should not be a tax lien sale with a long and indefinite period of redemption. Okay. Let me tell you how preventative action helps people. And I'm going to give you a true story. It took place in Providence, and it happens all across this county and across this state. I want you to consider the actual damage that was caused to a lady named Christy Ware in Providence. Christy faced difficulties on several fronts, and it led to her abandoning her ownership responsibility to her property in Providence. Neither the city nor the county took any preventative action. In fact, the county began selling tax lien sales to multiple tax lien buyers. By the time a master commissioner sale took place over a period, in this case, eight or nine years, the court ordered judgment against Christie and the property was $33,000. The winning bidder at the master commissioner sale, was the bid was $15,000.
Four months later, that winning bidder sold the property as is for $38,000. Now think about the mortgage company. The mortgage company could see the as is value of the property. They knew the cost of carrying if they had wound up owning that property. They knew the payoff amount of these taxes. Their only prudent option was to not make any further investment in that property. And because taxes are a lien against the property and a lien against the person, Christie now faced a personal deficiency judgment that totaled $20,000 after having lost her home. If the city or the county, and actually in this program, I believe they both should work together, had taken preventative action after the second year, then the judgment amount would have been lower. The property value, not setting idle for six or seven years, would have been higher. And at a minimum, Christie would have walked away with $10,000 of equity instead of $20,000 worth of debt after losing their home. We're not doing people a favor here. Mr. Schomer, some of our people have to get back to work, you know, so uh, I mean, I appreciate your presentation. Does anybody have any more questions that you want to ask? I have one brief question, and unfortunately, I'm one of those that has to get back to work. Yeah. You know, in our community, we have, uh, we do have abandoned properties. We have a lot of abandoned properties, so we don't know who the owners were. Right. My property is at the Jackson Church. Have you dealt with situations such as that? Yeah. There is large acreage of parcels in this community that may not, we may not be able to identify who the owners are. And you don't have to in the end if that's the case. You can still foreclose if they've abandoned their ownership responsibility. We, we can foreclose in these mass foreclosures and an interim foreclosure, am I right? We've done it before. It just seems that it's bad for a community to have property that cannot be taken advantage of, sold, people pay taxes on it, and otherwise not being kept currently. Yeah. And, and I assume you have a nuisance abatement. Uh, we also have a bad property tax. Yeah. Any other questions?
Has all the bills been paid on the top the uh, improvements on citizens bank line? Yes. Speed bumps really don't 
act as a deterrent. But depends on how big the speed bump is. I thought a Prius. Yeah. Now, the reverse speed bumps that we had on Carlisle did work. Okay. <laughs> but I think yeah. if, if you have a longer sloping speed bump, it's more effective than just having one little hump. You know, uh, I think of streets that I've driven on before that have a longer sloping. But both of these guys kind of speed ways. type speed bump. Well, know. I think that that would probably be our our best route. So. Okay. I mean, short of some type of agreement with Charlie's that that property to be used, and he won't, they will probably won't want that liability. And yeah. And our accurate, I just think it's true. Okay. Well, what about is there's a little street that you, I don't know if it's a street I cross from where that. Uh, about halfway down, there's the one that where you can come out over here on 231. We don't own that anymore. That, that's been closed. No, that's, that's been closed. closed. <laughs> Part of Buffalo Island. Yeah. yeah. It was closed. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's still there where you can drive through it. <laughs> yeah. But, it, but it's private it's property. Closed. <laughs> <laughs> there's no sign saying do No, that we don't own that. <laughs> All right. Moving on to the next one. Council member resignation. I have a resignation from uh, Sidney Cook. Uh, dated November the 15th and it just says it's been such a privilege and pleasure to work and serve the city of Hartford with each of you. You truly are a council built on integrity and moral character. Due to my family moving to property in the county and outside the city limits, it, it has rendered me ineligible to continue to serve as a council member for the city of Hartford. I will always support the council, the city of Hartford, and all the positive initiatives you are working for make the city better better for its residents respectfully years so that's her resignation we don't have to vote to accept it but if you choose to uh, we'll be, uh, we'll take that motion if you choose to accept it but you don't have to I'll just note for the record that uh, that becomes effective as of this meeting but uh, as the end of the year's approach and you all have already identified who the new council is going to be I think it's going to be moot yeah. Yeah. It is. So it's not necessary for us to even accept it. It's effective no. by law. Okay, I just want to read that to you to make it effective. Um, I have done our ethics and financial disclosure. I will say this for the new council members who are present. I do have forms that you have to fill out. It's an uh, ethics and uh, just see me afterwards. Um, these are disclosures about your finances. It doesn't ask you how much you make or anything like that, but it does ask for sources and it's just according to the Kentucky Revised Stand Statutes, we all have to do that every year. All right, uh, we have an ordinance 1809 that you have before you. Um, this is the ordinance which is changing our pay scale and the reason we had to do that was because what we were doing with the code enforcement officer, with the fire chief, with the cemetery worker, uh, uh, we could not pay them a stipend. It had to be done at a, as an hourly uh, rate. So what we have done is I found the approximate number of hours they work each month and we're going to pay them a pay rate which would give them the same amount of pay that we give them now in a stipend. And this just makes it legal. Uh, did have to raise, um, we see the code enforcement officer, the fire chief, and the uh, supervisor of maintenance. Those limits have been uh, calculated according to what they would take. I think the code enforcement officer would make uh, $14.79. He works approximately 14, that's for calculating on 14 hours a month. Uh, the fire chief uh, works approximately 20 hours a month. His would be approximately $15 per hour. And then the cemetery supervisor of maintenance had to be raised to about 1917 to give him the same approximate income that he would make. That would be his per hour. Just curious on the fire chief, is that, is that uh, clerical stuff that they're doing or is that extra time they're also on a fire line? No, it's no fire one. It's actually serving as a chief. Uh, 
So fire, fire runs, runs are not in, in any shape. Is, is there the meetings? It's, uh, his fire roll would come under the, his volunteer status, but you have yeah. an ordinance specifying yeah. what duties he has. So, yeah, I just want to make sure that yeah. fire it's not, it's not fire run. Okay. But basically everything else is the same. So it's primarily modified for those three positions. So you just need a first reading? Yes, this will be a first reading. Go ahead. City of Hartford, Kentucky, Ordinance 2018-09. An ordinance adopting a new pay scale to provide guidance for the compensation of employees for the City of Hartford in accordance with the existing personnel classification and pay plan ordinances and to establish length of service awards to recognize employees' longevity of employment with the city. Okay, first reading. <coughs> um, are you, are people going to be available next week for a special call meeting because I'm hoping by that time I would have also the people to uh, fill in the blanks that we'll have at the, on the different boards. Uh, you know, the planning and zoning board, the wastewater treatment board, the code enforcement board, uh, could have those people ready to be uh, approved. What day next week? Next week, um, Thursday. That would be the 20th. 20th. I can't say Monday because we don't have enough time to notify. I will not be available. Okay. Um, I got to work nights the night before that. They were sending all of our students out on their uh, holiday vacation. Okay. So I'll be driving them to Nashville at 1 a.m. All right. Well. And I'll be there until like noon. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, Monday doesn't give us enough time to, no, to notify the media of the specific agenda. Although, what we would be doing would be having a second reading of the ordinance and, <laughs> and uh, any approving any uh, nomination for people on the board. But we don't have enough time to notify them, even 24 hour notices for Monday. I could do Tuesday or Friday. Uh, I won't be here Tuesday. I'm living the day, does it? <laughs> I'd leave you Friday. Uh, next week, uh, yeah. uh, following week, we'll be out Monday and Tuesday for Christmas Day. So uh, we could possibly do it yeah. like a part of that week after Christmas, between yeah. Christmas and New Year's. Does that work? Yeah, that'd be better for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we'll, just con we'll just contact you and try to find a date that, uh, where we can get the majority of people here. All right? Okay. Just heads up. <coughs> right there. A cemetery, we've, we've already discussed that. Uh, what we've talked about was maybe trying to find, well, I mean, it's in the pay scale. We oh, talk, okay. Yeah. It's, uh, we had talked about perhaps trying to find independent somebody my independent. understanding that, that, that there might be somebody expressed that interest is that correct yeah but it, that has changed and that person is no longer a viable candidate uh, and no longer that person no longer employed and the one who is employed now is the only part of it okay you're talking uh, about to evaluate the pay scale but no to uh, Right. Somebody take somebody sure. independent to take care of the cemetery. They were interested in helping the lots. And stuff like that. Yeah, but uh, that was the former employee at Miller Chapmire. He's not there now. The current doesn't want to do it because he'd be serving as uh, chief deputy coroner, and he doesn't feel like he'll have the time, you know, to put into it. So, so we pretty well got handled with the new pay scale to take care of. Priest House, um, we still have not gotten that um, assessed yet. Um, oh gosh, who, who was in there? Mitch. Mitch is buying a house over in Beaverham and it's moving out. And we had talked about just selling it. Um, since then, I've had an employee come to me and say that they would like to rent it once Mitch is out. Um, we'd have to determine what the rent would be, but uh, it's a water plant employee, which would be 
extremely advantageous for us to have somebody there that walking distance of the yeah. water plant, uh, especially in inclement weather, emergencies, things like that. Yeah. Um, they they approached about going ahead and rent it, and probably we would get more rent off of the house than we would in property taxes. We probably realize more in rent than we would in property taxes for the house. So it's up to you what you want to do. That's where our situation is right now. So we have no idea what the price value of the house is? No. Um, George I did mention something the other day, though, about um, you have several trucks that sometimes have to access the water plant through that lot that we weren't aware of because of the way it's laid out. <coughs> they can turn around up there, so they have to go through a gate come down that driveway to get, get out. But other than that, I mean... The property was donated to us? Yeah. Right? I mean, I think it makes sense for them. I kind of thought yeah, that. we need to rent it. Well, I do too. I think we need to rent it. I mean, yeah. Unless the value of the house was so great that it would more than offset. But if we got to have access to it to get to the plant, it kind of makes kind of makes it tough. You think that joins the city water plant? It's behind the it city water need, plant. I think we need yeah. to keep on. I think it's pretty obvious oh, as we keep it like yeah. it is. Okay. Are they going? Are they willing to help maintain the house? Oh yeah. Aren't you, Josh? Yes. Well, that's something that, you know, you have to decide what that rent's going to be. Uh, what was that paying? Three. But there, was, <coughs> there were significant improvements that you put into the home. I mean, it's, I will give him credit. It, it, from everything I've seen. I think that you almost have to look at two things. One is that what improvements you're expecting from the new tenant, and then somewhere between it and fair market value of rent, and then somewhere mm -hmm. rent lies in the middle of the thing. <coughs> well, I'd say probably Roger Embry's probably got the best idea of what fair market value rent is for it. And and what expectations you'd have on improvements, and then we try to find somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Let me go ahead and check into that and see what he what he says, and then um, that's the last action that we can take. Uh, do they? Well, the informational that I have, I want to remind of the elected current. Uh, elected officials that uh, January 23rd through 25th is the uh, orientation in Owensboro. I'd recommend that you attend that. Uh, you'll contact the city. We'll see about trying to help you with your registration fees. Um, also, too, before the first year, we'll have to have you have to be administered the oath of office. Uh, usually, there's some type of a ceremony that the county puts on uh, for all the county officials, city officials, all get uh, the oath of office at the same time. If you can't make that, uh, then I can administer the oath of office to you in the office at any time. Before, but it's got to be done before the 1st of January, so you make sure you're responsible okay, about it. Yes. Pardon? Actually, within 30 days, but they can't take any action until the oath is are you going to find out the date of when they're going to have Yeah, we'll know five you whenever the, the judge determines what they're going to do over there. Okay. Just don't challenge anyone to a duel between now and then. Yeah. Or be a second. I'm holding off. Or don't be a second either. Don't hold the phone over either. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any information that you want to dispense to the, to the group? All right. Uh, let, me remind, let me remind you, uh, newly elected officials, pick up your little form, fill out. It takes five minutes to fill out, to, but it's a requirement, you know, that we have to have. So, all right. There's nothing else. Well, we Make up. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> okay. All in favor. I knew, you were, I knew it was coming. I just. Didn't.